Um, good morning, everyone. Today is September 11th, 2017. 16 years ago, right, just right up the street a few blocks away, an absolutely horrific event occurred. And today, even though it was so many years ago, whenever I come down here, and I'm sure all of you experience the same thing, you could still feel the energy of all the sentient beings that lost their life that day. And so today I would like to have our meditation time, have a little bit of practice for them and for all beings who are suffering, especially since we have the hurricanes, the fires, the floods, all around the world. So it's for everyone, but especially today for 9-11. The first thing I'd like to do is uh, recite the four reminders. This particular version of the four reminders was composed by Trungpa Rinpoche um, in 1974. And at that time, there was no translation of the Four Reminders, so he just said it right off the top of his head. And it's these words that are so powerful, because they weren't translated, he didn't read it from a text. It just came to him the way he remembered it when he was growing up, when probably one of the first things he studied as a child in Tibet. And uh, this is New York Buddha Dharma, for all of you that don't know. And um, we are a center that we began for the teachings of Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche and also other great enlightened teachers of our time. So what I'd like to do is just, when we read these, really think about um, the people that lost their lives in 9-11. And even more poignant, I mean, the people that have perished over the weekend, over the last couple of weeks, in the horrible hurricanes that we've had, and all the floods in Asia, and the fires out west. Um, Think about um, the the meaning of these words. So the first one we can all recite together. Joyful to have such a human birth, difficult to find, free and well-favored. But death is real, comes without warning. This body will be a corpse. Unalterable are the laws of karma. Cause and effect cannot be escaped. Samsara is an ocean of suffering, unendurable, unbearably intense.
I'd like to go over the meditation instruction that I received from Chagyam Trungpa Rinpoche when I first began to meditate. Um, because today the talk is about uh, the four um, noble truths, and one of the four noble truths is about meditation. So I thought it would be good to just give the instructions the way we received it from him. There are three parts to the instruction. The first part is posture. We take our seat, and if we have to sit in a chair, just sit straight and not lean back if you can, because it's important to have a straight back. And if you sit on a cushion, just cross your legs and put your hands on your thighs or on your knees. And um, just have a, str- a straight back, and we tuck our chin in just a little bit, and put the tip of our tongue behind our top the teeth. The second step is the breath. We naturally breathe in and out. And the out-breath is where we place our awareness in this particular practice. The in-breath just naturally takes care of itself because we just naturally always breathe in. Um, This is a very important point that Rinpoche made, was that the practice of shamatha is not a concentration practice. It's not something that we look at a certain object like a candle or a statue and concentrate on that. What we're doing is we're placing our awareness on the out-breath. 
that goes into the space that we're sitting in. And just relax into that space. Our awareness is on the breath and letting go of the breath into the space. We keep our eyes open because we want to be present in the space. The third step is labeling our thoughts. In shamatha meditation, our thoughts are treated in a very neutral way. Many thoughts come and go. The mind is always thinking. And here is a safe, neutral place where thoughts come and go, whether it's a good thought, happy, sad, angry thought, it doesn't matter. We just treat each thought as a neutral thing. So when we notice that our awareness is not on the out-breath anymore, and we're not in the space anymore, but we're caught up in a thought, we just simply say to ourselves, thinking, and then we gently bring our mind back to the awareness of the out-breath. It's not an aggressive uh, thought, oh, what am I doing? It's just a gentle reminder. But our allegiance is always, in this practice, in shamatha, our allegiance is always to come back to the breath. Now for just a few minutes, I would like to introduce a practice called Tonglen. Tonglen is a practice, or you could also say sending and taking. It's a practice where we think about, we, we take our breath and we send out healing white light, healing energy to others, one person in particular or many people, but today, since it's 9-11, maybe we could just send our white light healing out from our heart center out into the space, into this neighborhood, or our memories of what happened that day, or the sentient beings that still might be wandering in samsara now, wandering because they're lost, because they died in such a violent way. Or if you want to send that healing energy out to the people who have recently lost their lives in the hurricanes, the fires, the horrible flooding in Southeast Asia. Um, We just take our breath and send through our heart the white light out to them.
In this practice, you can close your eyes. And once you've sent the white light out, if you like, and you feel comfortable, you can take in their suffering, and maybe visualize it as dark light, and just bring it into us. So what we were doing is we're exchanging with them. We're sending out healing white light energy to them, and we're taking in their pain and suffering. But it's a very gentle practice, and we don't have to worry that somehow we'll be taking negative energy into ourselves because we cannot take in other people's negative energy. We can't take in their suffering literally, but it's an exchange and very beneficial for us to do a practice like this, to think of others. And, um, and so it's a helpful way to see things. And now, this is for you. Um, To dedicate the merit, I'd like to to introduce a prayer called the Metta Prayer, which Buddhists throughout the world do. It doesn't matter what lineage you're from or what school of Buddhism you're from. It's like a very fundamental kind of uh, ancient prayer. And there's a little tune that goes with it, so we can sing it. Does anyone know it? Um, I'll sing it, and then um, we could sing it three times. And just join in when you hear the tune. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe. May all beings awaken to the light of their true nature. May all beings be free. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe. May all beings awaken to the light of their true nature. May all beings be free. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings be happy. May all beings be safe. May all beings awaken to the light of their true nature. May all beings be free. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone have any comments or anything before we start the talk to say? Okay. Okay, well, tonight is the talk on the four noble truths. 
from the book Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, or as we used to say in the old days, the Bible, written by Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche in the early 70s, and edited by John Baker, one of the editors, John Baker, who's the co-founder of this New York Buddha Dharma, who's not here today. Um, okay, well, I, um, I just prepared like a little journey to take. So just relax and enjoy the journey. Okay, the birth and prediction. 2,500, what's well, 2,560 years ago, in the faraway land of India, in a kingdom called Sakya, there lived a king and queen. One night, Queen Mahamaya, a woman of great virtue, had a dream that a magnificent white elephant with six tusks descended from the heavens, surrounded by a chorus of beatific praises. The elephant approached her with skin as white as mountain snow. It held a brilliant pink lotus flower in its trunk and placed the flower within the queen's body. All at once she was filled with deep ease and joy. She awoke uplifted by a sensation of pure bliss. When she got up from her bed, the ethereal music from her dream still echoed in her ears. She told her husband, King Sohodana, of the dream, and he too marveled at it. That morning, the king summoned all the spiritual advisors in the capital to come and devise the meaning of the queen's dream. Your majesty, they said, the queen will give birth to a child who will be a great leader. This child is destined to become either a mighty emperor who rules throughout the four directions or a great teacher who will show the way and the truth to all beings in heaven and earth. Our land, your majesty, has long awaited the appearance of such a great one. It was a custom in those days for a woman to return to her parents' home to give birth there. Queen Mahamaya was from the country of Kolia. Along the way, she stopped to rest in the garden of Lumbini. The forest there was filled with flowers and singing birds. Peacocks fanned their splendid tails in the morning light, admiring an Ashok tree. The to, admiring an Ashok tree. In full bloom, the queen walked toward it. Suddenly, feeling unsteady, she grabbed a branch of the Ashok tree to support herself. A moment later, still holding the branch, Queen Mahamaya gave birth to a radiant child. The prince was bathed in fresh water and wrapped in yellow sink by Queen Mahamaya's attendants. As there was no longer any need to return to Ramagama, the queen and the newborn prince returned to the palace. The king, overcome with joy, named the baby Siddhartha, meaning the one who accomplishes the dream. The first noble truth, the truth of suffering. The Sanskrit word for suffering is dukkha. Why Sanskrit? That's the language of ancient India, the language of the Buddha, Shakyamuni, Gautama Buddha. Suffering, dissatisfaction, or pain occurs because the mind spins around in such a way that there seems to be no beginning and no end to its motion. Nothing ever seems to be quite right, no matter how hard we try. Even when we experience fun, it always comes back to the same sense of dissatisfaction. The continuing action of struggle and preoccupation is very irritating and painful. Eventually, one begins to become irritated by just being me. No matter what we do, there is always a deep feeling of mind's neurosis, pleasure, pain, eating, sleeping, work, play, Whatever we do, we are always experiencing dissatisfaction, a letdown, 
To understand dukkha, suffering, is to understand mind's neurosis. Somehow, we pattern life in a way that never allows enough time to accurately taste its flavor. There is continual busyness, continual grasping for the next best thing, a grasping towards life. That is suffering, dukkha. The first step to understanding and confronting suffering is the first noble truth, which is the first thing that the Buddha taught when he attained enlightenment. Now this is a quote from Tralig Rinpoche from a book called The Essence of Buddhism. Suffering. This does not mean the Buddha did not acknowledge the existence of happiness or contentment in life. The point he was making is that there is happiness and also sorrow in the world. The reason why everything we experience in our everyday life is said to be dukkha is that even when we have some kind of happiness, it is not permanent. It is subject to change. So unless we can gain insight into the truth of what is really able to give us happiness and what is unable to provide happiness, the experience of dissatisfaction will persist. And then Rinpoche, Trollic Rinpoche goes on to say, the three marks of existence. The key to understanding the truth of suffering is what the Buddha called the three marks of existence, which is pervaded by three things. One, impermanence, anitya, Things come and go. Everything is subject to change. And two, dissatisfaction or suffering, dukkha. See things the way they truly are. Three, insubstantiality, anatman, without a self. The person we might right, be right now is not the same person we were two minutes ago or will be in two minutes from now. And so this is the change that's always happening. And the 16 Karmapa, there's no picture of him here, but that's the 17th up there. The 16th Karmapa, when asked to explain what Buddhism was, in one sentence said, everything changes. Okay. Finding the way. As a child, Siddhartha lived a sheltered life of luxury and privilege. As a young man, Siddhartha came to find palace life to be stifling and meaningless. He began making excursions beyond the palace to see what life was like outside. He saw people suffering. He began to realize that there is birth, death, sickness, and old age. He also saw a sage walking along the street, and that inspired him. He realized this was the example and the way of life he wanted to follow. Although his father tried everything he could think of to keep him in the palace, Siddhartha knew he needed to leave and find his own way. It was hard for him to leave his beautiful and loving wife and child, but he knew she she understood and had encouraged him to seek the spiritual path he longed for. One night, as his wife and child slept, he left the palace to begin his life as an ascetic. This was Prince Siddhartha, the future Buddha. The second noble truth, Trungpa Rinpoche, the origin of suffering. Having become aware of our dissatisfaction, we begin to search for a reason for the source of the dissatisfaction. By examining our thoughts and actions, we discover that we are continually struggling to maintain and enhance ourselves. We realize that this struggle is the root of suffering. So we seek an understanding of the process of struggle, that is, of how how ego a belief in a truly existent, solid self develops and operates. 
This is the second noble truth, the origin of suffering. The big thing to understand here is that even when we see that maintaining ourself causes suffering, trying to rid ourselves of our ego or self is just another form of suffering. Spending our time on self-improvement is the problem. Well, you know, when he wrote this book in the 70s, it was just a spiritual supermarket. I mean, if he was alive now and he saw what was going on, I think he would have a heart attack. But (laughs) then it was, you know, problematic, but nothing like it is today. Insights come only when there are gaps in our struggle, only when we stop trying to rid ourselves of thoughts, when we cease siding with pious, good thoughts against bad, impure thoughts, only when we allow ourselves simply to see the nature of thought, the nature of thought, do we begin to see that there is a sane, awake quality within us. In fact, this quality manifests itself only in the absence of struggle. This is a question at the back of this chapter that someone asked. Rinpoche, many people are aware of the truth of suffering, but do not move on to the second step. Awareness of the origin of suffering. Why is that? Rinpoche said, I think it is largely a matter of paranoia. We want to escape. We want to run away from pain rather than regard it as a source of inspiration. We feel the suffering to be bad enough, so why investigate it further? Some people who suffer a great deal and realize that they cannot escape their suffering really begin to understand it. But most people are too busy attempting to rid themselves of irritation, too busy seeking distractions from themselves to look into the material they already have. It is too embarrassing to look into it. This is the attitude of paranoia. If you look too closely, you will find something fearful. But in order to be a completely inspired person like Gautama Buddha, you have to be very open-minded and intelligent, even though it may be ugly, painful, and repulsive. (laughs) Who hasn't been there? This kind of scientific-mindedness is very important. This kind of motivation is not intellectual. It is intuitive and precise. And when he used the word scientific mindedness, that's what um, the Dalai Lama is always talking about. Like all the teachers always talk about science. I could never figure it out until I read this again. So this kind of motivation is not intellectual. It is intuitive and precise. It's like what you genuinely really feel inside of you. Okay. A bowl of milk. It was a full moon day. At her mother's request, Sujata put on a new pink sari and carried a platter of food to offer to the forest gods. There were cakes, milk, congee, and honey. The noon sun blazed. As Sujata neared the river, she saw a man lying unconscious on the road. She put down her platter and ran to him. He was barely breathing, and his eyes were tightly closed. His cheeks had the sunken look of someone who had not had food for a long time. From his long hair, tangled beard, and ragged garments, Sujata knew he he was a mountain ascetic who must have been training and had fainted from hunger. Without hesitation, she poured a cup of milk and eased it against the man's lips spilling a few drops on them. At first, he did not respond, but then his lips quivered and parted slightly. Sujata poured more milk into his mouth. He began to drink, and before long, the cup was empty. Sujata then sat along the river bank to see if the man would regain consciousness. Slowly, he sat up and opened his eyes. Seeing Sujata, he smiled. He pulled the end of his garment back over his shoulder 
and folded his legs in a lotus position. He began to breathe, first shallowly and then more deeply. His sitting was stable and beautiful. Thinking that he must be a mountain god, Sujata joined her palms and began to prostrate herself before him, but the man motioned for her to stop. Sujata sat up, and the man spoke to her in a soft voice. Child, please pour me a little more milk. Happy to hear him speak, Sujata poured another cup, and he drank it all. He felt how truly nourishing it was. Less than an hour before, he thought he had, was about to breathe his last breath. Now his eyes shone, and he smiled quietly. Sujata asked him how he had fainted on the road. I have been practicing meditation in the mountains. Harsh ascetic practices and discipline has left my body weak, so today I decided to walk down to the village to beg for some food, but I lost all my strength getting here. Thanks to you, my life has been saved. They sat along the river bank together, and the man told Sujata about himself. He was Siddhartha, the son of a king, who reigned over the country of the Sakya clan. Sujata listened carefully as Siddhartha told her. I have seen that abusing the body cannot help one to find peace or understanding. The body is not just an instrument, it is a temple of the spirit, the raft by which we cross over to the other side. I will no longer practice self-mortification. I will go into the village each morning to beg for food. Sujata joined her palms. Honorable hermit, if you allow me, I will bring you food each day. There is no need for you to interrupt your meditation practice. My home is not far from here, and I know my parents would be happy for me to bring you your meal. Siddhartha was silent for a moment. Then he answered, I am glad to accept your offer, but from time to time I would also like to go into the village to beg in order to meet the villagers. I would like to meet your parents and the other children in the village. Sujata was happy. She joined her palms and bowed in gratitude. The Third Noble Truth The Truth of the Goal The Third Noble Truth, The Truth of the Goal, that is the absence of struggle, non-striving. We need only to drop the effort to secure and solidify ourselves, and the awakened state is present. But soon we realize that letting go is only present for short periods of time. We need some discipline to bring us to, to letting be. We must walk a spiritual path. Ego must wear itself out like an old shoe, journeying from suffering to liberation. The fourth noble truth, the truth of the path. So Trungpa Rinpoche is saying that just because we see the source of the suffering, we need it's not just enough to see that, but we have to now have a certain technique, a certain path. So the fourth noble truth, the truth of the path, the spiritual path, the practice of meditation is the fourth noble truth. Meditation, one's whole practice, should be based on the relationship between you and nowness. You do not have to push yourself into the practice of meditation, but just let be. If you practice in this way a feeling of space, and ventilation automatically comes. The expression of the Buddha nature or basic intelligence that is working its way through confusion. Then you begin to find the understanding of the truth of the path. The fourth noble truth, simplicity, such as the awareness of walking. You lift one foot, you put it in front of you, then you lift your other foot and you put it in front of you. The same with breathing. You breathe in, you breathe out. The process of speaking, space, tea ceremony, anything we, can, we do can be punctuated with sitting practice. 
the practice of seeing the precision, the precision of situations at every moment is called shamatha meditation. Associated with the hinayana or lesser path, it means peacefulness. When you see newness at every moment, when, you see, when you're now in the space, there is no room for anything but openness and peace. Question. Rinpoche, can you say something more about allowing gaps to appear? I understand what you mean, but I do not understand how someone allows a gap. How does that, how does one let be? Rinpoche, generally, one should be completely satisfied with whatever situation arises and not look for entertainment from an external source. Generally, when we speak, we do not simply want to communicate to the other person, but we want a response as well. We want to be fed by the other person, which is a very egocentric way of communicating. We have to give up this desire to be fed. And then the gap automatically comes. We cannot produce the gap through effort. Important point here that Rinpoche makes is not to confuse shamatha with concentration practice. The practice of meditation, which focuses the mind on a particular point, like a candle, is focusing so as to be better able to control the mind and concentrate. This tends, Rinpoche says, this tends to develop a certain kind of mental calm on the mind, a mental gymnastics that does not deal with the totality of any given life situation. It does not transcend the dualistic view of life. The practice of samadhi does not involve concentration. This is a very important point to realize. Concentration practice are largely ego reinforcing. Although not purposely so in- intended, um, We tend to centralize into our heart. When we're concentrating on one thing, we centralize into our heart. Always focusing on the future uh, is habitual with ego, when we're always trying to get something, looking for future results. Because of this, we miss the intelligence and openness of the present moment. This, the whole point is not to focus on yourself too much and on future attainments, just to be in the present moment fully and completely. That's where we can work with situations fully and completely. One's whole practice is based on the relationship between you and nowness and newness. Okay. Open, spacious, and relaxed is what Rinpoche Gyamso Rinpoche always says. Open, spacious, and relax. Relax, relax, relax. But it sounds so easy, but not that easy to do. Okay. The wounded swan. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. I have to read Swasti the Buffalo Boy first. Swasti the Buffalo Boy worked all day tending buffalo to support his brothers and sisters. One afternoon, after he had bathed the buffaloes and cut a bushel of grass, Swasti felt like spending a quiet moment alone in the cool forest. Leaving the buffaloes grazing at the forest edge, Swasti looked around for a tall tree to rest against. Suddenly, he stopped. There was a man sitting silently beneath a papala tree, no more than 20 feet away. Svasti gazed at him in wonder. He had never seen anyone sit so beautifully. The man's back was perfectly straight, and his feet rested elegantly upon his thighs. He held himself with utmost stability and inner purpose, His eyes appeared to be half-closed, 
and his hands folded his folded hands rested lightly on his lap. He wore a faded yellow robe, which left one shoulder bare. His body radiated peace, serenity, and majesty. Just one look at him, and Swasti felt wonderfully refreshed. His heart trembled. He did not understand how he could feel something so special for a person he had never even met. But he stood immobile, in utter respect for a long moment. The man opened his eyes. He did not see Swasti at first, and he uncrossed his legs and gently massaged his ankles and the soles of his feet. Slowly he stood up and began to walk. Because he walked in the opposite direction, he did not see Swasti. Without even making a sound, Swasti watched the man take slow, meditative steps on the, along the forest floor. After seven or eight such steps, the man turned around, and it was then that he noticed Swasti. He smiled at the boy. No one had ever smiled with such gentle tolerance at Swasti before. As though drawn by an invisible force, Swasti ran towards the man. But when he was within a few feet, he stopped in his tracks, remembering that he had no right to touch anyone of higher caste. Svasti was an untouchable. He did not belong to any of the four social castes. Don't be afraid, child, the man said in a quiet and reassuring voice. At the sound of that voice, Svasti's fears disappeared. He lifted his head and gazed at the man's kind and tolerant smile. After hesitating for a moment, he stammered, Sir, I like you very much. The man lifted Svasti's chin in his hand and looked at the boy's eyes. And I like you also. Do you live nearby? Svasti did not answer. He took the man's right hand in his two hands and asked the question that was troubling him. When I touch you like this, aren't you being polluted? The man laughed and shook his head. Not at all, child. You are a human being, and I am a human being. You can't pollute me. Don't hesitate and don't listen to what ignorant people tell you. He took Svasti's hand and walked with him to the edge of the forest. The water buffaloes were still grazing peacefully. The man laughed at Svasti and asked, Do you tend these buffaloes? And that must be the grass you have cut for their dinner. What is your name? Is your house nearby? Svasti answered politely, Yes, sir, I care for these four buffaloes and that one calf. And that is the kusha grass I cut. My name is Svasti, and I live on the other side of the river, just beyond the village of Uruvela. Please, sir, what is your name, and where do you live? Can you tell me? The man answered kindly, Certainly, my name is Siddhartha, and my home is far away, but at present I am living in the forest. Are you a hermit? Siddhartha nodded. Svasti knew that hermits were usually men who lived and meditated in the mountains. Though they had just met and exchanged no more than a few words, Svasti felt a warm bond between his new friend. In Uruvela, no one had ever treated him with such respect and kindness. A great happiness surged within him, and he wanted somehow to express his joy. If only he had some gift he could give to Siddhartha. But there was no penny in his pocket, not even a piece of sugar or rock candy. What could he offer? He had nothing, but he summoned the courage to say, Mister, I wish I had something to give you as a gift, but I have nothing. Siddhartha looked at Svasti and smiled. But you do. You have something I would like very much. I do? Siddhartha pointed the pile of kusha grass. That grass you have cut for the buffaloes is soft and fragrant. If you could give me a few handfuls, I shall make it a sitting cushion for my meditation beneath the tree. That would make me very happy. Svasti's eyes shone. He ran to the pile of grass, gathered a large bundle in his arms, and offered it to Siddhartha. I just cut this grass down by the river. Please accept it. I can easily cut some more for the buffaloes. Siddhartha placed his hands together like a lotus bud and accepted the gift. He said, you are a very kind boy. I thank you. 
Go and cut some more grass for your buffaloes before it grows too late. If you have a chance, please come and see me tomorrow afternoon in the forest again. Young Svasti bowed his head in farewell and stood watching as Siddhartha disappeared back into the forest. Then he picked up his sickle and headed for the shore, his heart filled with the warmest of feelings. It was early autumn. The kusha grass was still soft and his sickle was newly sharpened. It wasn't long at all before Svasti had cut another large armful of kusha grass. Okay, this is a quote from Trangu Rinpoche. Question, what is the meaning of mindfulness? The student asked Trangu Rinpoche. I felt that it was important to conclude this today because mindfulness is a word that has been uh, given to everything, every situation in our society today. So Trangu Rinpoche is a great teacher a Kagyu teacher, and this is what he said. It means not forgetting goodness, i.e. constantly remembering what it is we should be doing and what we should not be doing. It means to remember as opposed to forgetting. Those with excellent mindfulness always remember what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. Other people may be a less, a little less mindful and only remember every hour or so. Or other people, people may only remember like once a day. Be, or they might remember and think, oh, be good and compassionate. Try not to do anything harmful once a day. Even if we only remember these things once a day, it's still mindfulness. What we need to do is to develop our mindfulness. We need to start reminding ourselves again and again, what we should be doing and what is best to stop doing. Uh, okay, this I'm going to read for Tim. This is a story for you, Tim. The story of the wounded swan. One day when I was uh, the wounded swan, early the next morning, Svasti led his buffaloes to graze. By noon, he had cut enough kusha grass to fill two baskets. He decided to take a rice offering to Siddhartha for lunch. From a distance, he saw his new friends sitting beneath the great papala tree, but Siddhartha was not alone. Before him sat a, a girl just at about Swasti's age, dressed in a fine sari. There was food already placed before him, and Swasti stopped abruptly, but Siddhartha looked up and called to him, Svasti, he motioned for the boy to come and join them. As they ate the rice, Siddhartha told them a story, the story of the wounded swan. One day, when I was nine years old and strolling alone in the garden, a swan suddenly dropped from the sky and writhed on the ground in front of me in great pain. I ran to pick it up and I discovered that an arrow had deeply penetrated one of its wings. I clasped the, my hand around it firmly, the arrow shaft, and yanked it out. The bird cried as blood oozed from its wound. I applied pressure to the wound and placed medicinal leaves on it. I was about to go find some rice for the swan when my eight-year-old cousin Deva Datta burst into the room. He was clutching his bow and arrow. And he asked excitedly, Siddhartha, did you see a white swan fall down here? Before I could answer, Devadatta saw the swan. He ran towards it, but I stopped him. You may not take the bird, I said. My cousin protested, that bird is mine. I shot it myself. I stood between Devadatta and the swan, determined not to let him have it. I told him, this bird is wounded. I'm protecting it. It needs to stay here. Devadatta was quite stubborn and not about to give in. He argued, now listen, cousin, when this bird was flying in the sky, it did not belong to anyone. I, as I'm the one who shot it out of the sky, it rightfully belongs to me. Listen, cousin, I told him, those who love each other live together, and those who are enemies live apart. 
You tried to kill the swan, so you and she are enemies. The bird and I love each other, and we live together. The bird needs me, not you. Sujata clapped her hands. That's right, you were right. Siddhartha looked at Swasti. And what do you think, child, of my statement? I think you were right, but most people would agree with Devadatta. Siddhartha replied, In this world, few people look with eyes of compassion and merciless towards each other. The weak are always oppressed by the strong. I see that my reasoning was correct that day, for it arose from love and understanding, which can ease the suffering of all beings. The truth is the truth whether or not it is accepted by the majority. Therefore, I tell you, children, it takes great courage to stand up for and protect what is right. What happened to the swan teacher, asked Sujata. For four days I cared for her. When I saw that her wound was healed, I released her after warning her to fly far away, lest she be shot again. Siddhartha looked at the two children and bid them good day. They both promised to return soon with more of their friends. Siddhartha promised to give them more teachings as well. Chogyam Trungpa. An intimate relationship with yourself. Meditation practice takes place on a personal level. It involves an intimate relationship with ourselves. Great intimacy is involved. It has nothing to do with achieving perfection, achieving some absolute state or other. It is purely getting into what we are, really examining our actual psychological process without being ashamed of it. It is just friendship with ourselves. That's a quote from um, Meditation in Glimpses of Abhidharma. And then Rinpoche said, without meditation, there is no way in and no way out. Okay, last story, Tangerine of Mindfulness. After sitting and practicing mindfulness for a long time, Siddhartha knew he had found the great way. He had attained his goal, and now his heart experienced perfect peace and ease. Just then, Swasti appeared. Teacher, Swasti joined his palms and bowed. He took a few steps toward, forward, but then stopped. You look so different today. How do I look? Swasti replied, It's like, like you are a bright star in the sky. You look like a lotus that's just blossomed, and like, like the moon over Gaya Shaya Peak. Siddhartha grasped Swasti's hand. This is the happiest day of my life, the happiest day I've ever known. You can, If you can, bring all the children to come see me by the papala tree this afternoon. Don't forget your brothers and sisters, but first go and cut the kusha grass for your buffaloes. That afternoon, the children gathered beneath the papala tree. They brought food and offerings for Siddhartha and each other. He invited them to sit down and said, Today is the happiest day of my life, because last night I found the great way. Please, please enjoy this happiness too. In the fu near future, I will teach this path to others. Sujato looked up with surprise. You will be going? You mean you will leave us? Siddhartha smiled kindly. Yes, I must leave, but I won't abandon you, children. Before I leave, I will show you this path that I have discovered. Nananda Nandabala offered him and all the children tangerines. Siddhartha accepted and said, When you eat a tangerine, you can eat it with awareness or without awareness. What does it mean to eat a tangerine with awareness? When you are eating the tangerine, you are aware that you are eating the tangerine. You fully experience its lovely fragrance and f sweet taste. When you peel the tangerine, you know that you are peeling the tangerine. When you remove a slice and put it in your mouth, you know that you are removing a slice 
and putting it into your mouth. And you can then experience its sweet fragrance and taste. The tangerine Nandabala offered me had nine sections. I ate each morsel in awareness and saw how precious and wonderful it was. All the children ate their tangerines in awareness too. Children, eating the tangerine of mindfulness means that while eating the tangerine, you are truly in touch with it. Your mind is not chasing after thoughts of yesterday or tomorrow, but is dwelling fully in the present moment. The tangerine is truly present. When we live in the present moment, we can understand life. Understanding leads to tolerance, peace, and love. Swasti joined his palms, respected teacher. Could we call this path the path of awareness? Siddhartha smiled. Surely we can. The path of awareness leads to perfect awakening. Sujata joined his palms. Sujata joined her palms to ask permission to speak. You are the awakened one, the one who shows how to live in awareness. Can we call you the awakened one? Siddhartha nodded. That would please me very much. Sujata's eyes shone. She continued. Awaken in Magadhi is pronounced Bud. A person who is awakened would be called Buddha in Magadhi. Can we call you Buddha? Siddhartha nodded. All the children were delighted. So now I think it's time for Doha. Doha, can you take notes on the Doha? We have a poetess among us, a published poet. Um, the way this works is, Sasha, can you explain how it works? <clears throat> the Doha is done so that one is able to communicate their feeling in the moment. And when we have a class, and this has actually been taught to us by Trumpa Rinpoche, and after a class or after a feast, we do this because the Sangha then is able to come together and each person in a room can express something by saying, usually we do like three words or a phrase, and then another person says another phrase, and there's a scribe. And so it just keeps going, and it's uh, completely extemporaneous. It's just like space and whatever you do. And then afterwards, it's read to us. And uh, that's it. Whoever feels like starting, do you want to start? OK. A single slice. More easily heard than done. More easily, more easily heard than done. Unbridled fear. Sitting in peace, sitting with peace in the eyes of the storm. Me and now. I love the simple stories of the Buddha. Uh, 
Sweet is Time. What was the last thing you said? What did Sweet you is Time. Wake up to your own Buddha nature. Correct me if I got anybody's part wrong. A single slice, more easily heard than done, unbridled fear, sitting with peace in the eye of the storm. Me in now, in space. I love the simple stories of the Buddha. Sweet is time. Wake up to your own Buddha nature. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything to add? Anything to say about the day? I just wanted to say I'm so happy we did, did Doha. I love it so much. Thank you. <laughs> Sasha's idea. We talked on the phone today. He said, don't forget to do the Doha. And so I wrote it down on the list to do Doha. Yeah, it's a very important way to express a feeling or a moment in time. Also, seals class. Seals the class. Mm -hmm. Sacred space, or the mandala that we have created. Would you like to say something about why you like to hear the stories of the Buddha? They, they're so powerfully true. They, re, they refresh me over and over again. I've been hearing them. I was thinking on my way here that I have actually been knowing about the Buddha and learning about the Buddha for almost 50 years. Wow. And uh, just to hear it tonight again, it was like, it's just awesomely perfect tonight. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you so much for those stories. Um, I had the same feeling. Um, it's just when you first began to read them, I, I thought to myself, why is it always so wonderful just to sit back and hear the stories? It's just what a pleasure. Thank you a lot. Okay. Um, I just oh. want to say that today is 9-11. And 16 years. And it couldn't be more appropriate. So, I, thank you. The thing that Rinpoche um, said I remember him saying about the Buddha was that um, he was just a person that really had the inspiration to work with himself. And if people say that he was a god or someone special and that's why he attained enlightenment, then that's a really big insult. And I think the reason that he said that was because um, we could feel that we could do the same thing in one lifetime achieve, you know, attain enlightenment, if we just and he, he, up, apply the simple techniques, they're not hard. But because it's so simple, people get confused. And I think these stories are, are so powerful is because of the simplicity of just the way he led his life. It's so simple. And um, that's what Trungpa Rinpoche was always trying to point to, and all the teachers always trying to point to, of uh, just keeping it very simple. Not make a big deal.
like especially uh, rang true, I don't know if rang true for you, when he said, when Rinpoche said, um, well, you get sick of being me, you know, it's like get sick of being yourself. Because, I mean, how many times can we do the same thing over and over again and just like not want to run away from ourselves, you know? Uh, but that's like, uh, the key is to always coming back to the simplicity of just accepting ourselves, starting from who we are, and and working with that in a simple way, and not rejecting ourselves on so many different levels. And the thing about Siddhartha was that he had, people think, well, he had it so good. He had a great life. And why did he want to leave that life? And maybe it was because, you know, he had, uh, you know, a bigger plans, you know, like a bigger view because of a past life or whatever. Probably, I don't know. But um, he, I guess felt the need to really see what was really going on in a genuine way. He was a very genuine person. And his, I guess, wanted to work with himself, but really had such compassion for others, like the way he treated Swasti. He was an untouchable. And Siddhartha was a Brahmin. He was from a Brahmin kingdom, a prince. And he touched an, an untouchable boy, a buffalo boy like the worst, the worst, like, profession, would say, and didn't think anything of it. Maybe when he was living in the palace, he wouldn't have thought of doing, he'd never come in contact with a person like that. But because of his practice, because at this point, he was already, he had finished starving himself, and he was just practicing and eating and just living a simple life. And so he could see the beauty in this young boy. But even when he was a child, and he found that wounded swan, he still had such great compassion and st stood up to his cousin and wouldn't allow his cousin to you know, take the bird. That was great courage. So these are stories that in our everyday life, I think that we can reflect on and work with. But the most important thing, I think, the very most important thing is to have courage to work with ourselves. It's very easy to, you know, like if you're walking down the street and you see someone being abused, you can say, hey, stop that. You know, it's like we're a bodhisattva. But the most difficult thing, I think, is to have some sympathy and compassion towards ourselves and our own shortcomings. Because that's the obstacle we deal with every single moment, every single moment. And the more we practice, the more we come in contact with the way our mind works. And the most important thing is not to centralize into a self, like centralize into who we think we are, but to see that this is the human condition. It just happens to be our story, but everybody's got a story. I always like to say the yin and the yang. Everyone's got a story. <laughs> you know? So you might as well just deal with what you have and not make a big deal about it. And that's the way to really be of, of use to others is when we start to work with ourselves in a kind and loving way. That's the only way that we can really help other people is when we care about ourselves in a genuine way. That's what all the teachers say anyway. <laughs> Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, so we should dedicate the merit. Um. <laughs> How was Kandra Rinpoche's uh, teachings up at up? In Red Hook, Kandra Rinpoche. Didn't she teach up at Red Hook? Kandra Rinpoche. How was it? 
Yeah, sorry I couldn't go. I'm sorry I couldn't make it up there, but I knew she was up there in Red Hook at Bartotuku Center, right? A jewel. Kandu Rinpoche is a, a wonderful uh, female but living Buddha, I would say, teacher that we have, and you're a student of hers. She's amazing. And this summer, she was up at Bartotuku Rinpoche Center in Red Hook, New York, for a weekend. What did she teach on? She's an amazing teacher. If anyone ever has an opportunity to meet her. Okay. By this merit, may all obtain omniscience. May it defeat the enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. From the ocean of samsara, may I free all beings. By the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom. May the dark ignorance of sentient beings be dispelled. May all beings enjoy profound, brilliant glory. Thank you.